Brandon Suffolk, 1935. The town had remained fairly much the same since the First World War. The population was just over 2,500 and rabbit fur, farming and timber supplied most employment for Brandon folk, which usually meant labouring for low wages. So you could understand the excitement that surrounded the time when a movie was shot in town. To give a taste of Brandon back then, I can tell you that on Monday the 11th of February, the town saw a new cinema open. It was called The Avenue Cinema, its location giving rise to its name. It replaced a second-hand wooden structure that was brought to Brandon before the end of First World War by a war veteran named Stanley Lingwood. Stanley then sold the wooden cinema to Mr Ben Cooley in the 1930s, but it was destroyed by a mysterious fire not long after Mr Cooley took ownership. Mr Cooley, who had already built a modern cinema in Thetford, soon set about rebuilding Brandon's version with the insurance payout he received. Both cinema buildings are still standing today, with a Thetford one still in use as a venue for bingo, but Brandon's old cinema is dilapidated and destined to be pulled down for redevelopment. Back to the cinema's opening day, that very first movie shown that day on Monday the 11th of February was an American musical called One Night of Love, starring Grace Moore, whose background was operatic singing. Brandon saw many parades and fates throughout the year, including this one in September. Then, the following month, October, a movie crew arrived in town and recorded a scene for a British movie starring one of the nation's best-loved and well-known actors. It was based upon a 1934 French movie called Mauvais Grain, which translates into English to be Bad Seed. The plot of that film centres on its main character, Henri Pasquier, a rather wealthy but bored playboy who joins a gang of car thieves after his father stops his allowance. He falls in love with Jeannette, a female car thief, and they are then both set up by the boss of the gang who portrays them to the police. The British version, titled First Offence, saw the female lead character retain her name, Jeannette, but the name of the lead character was swapped from Henri to Johnny Penrose. Actress Lily Palmer was given the role of Jeanette in what was to be her first leading role. She would then go on to become one of Britain's best-known actresses of her era, but she was actually born in Poznan, which today is in Poland, but in 1914, when she was born, it was in Germany. With Hitler coming to power in the 1930s and his subsequent persecution of the Jews, Lily's family fled Germany, and it was London they ended up just a year or so before this movie was filmed. Liddy would eventually end up in Hollywood, marry the famous British actor Rex Harrison and continue her long movie career until her death in the 1980s. Liddy, whose German surname was Pizer, took on the familiar English surname of Palmer in order to be more attractive to movie makers during a time when Britain was fearing German aggression in Europe. The lead male playing Johnny Penrose was John Mills, who in 1976 was knighted Sir John Mills for his work in movies. Indeed, he was one of the most famous British actors of his era. Although he is regarded as a Suffolk lad, he was actually born in Watts Naval School at North Elmham near Dereham, Norfolk. John Mills first appeared in a movie in 1932, but by 1935 he already had a prolific acting career behind him, appearing in 13 movies, some as the lead actor before landing this role in First Offence. Interestingly, his first lead was in a war movie about a Royal Navy battleship in the First World War. This was titled Brown on Resolution, but that would later be renamed as Forever England. The actor who played his naval captain in that movie was in fact a decorated submarine commander from the First World War, H.G. Stoker, cousin of Dracula author Bram Stoker. H.G. Stoker played John Mills' father, Dr. Penrose, in The First Offence. Not only was the movie based on a French film, but there were other French connections too. The film's distributor was Gaumont Film Company, which had just released The 39 Steps in 1935. And this was born from a pioneering French movie company with roots dating back to the late 1890s. It was another arm of Gaumont, Gainsborough Pictures, which carried out the filming of First Offence. And this was the team who came to Brandon. 
The studio was very prolific in the 1930s and First Offence was just one of eight movies released by them in 1936. Alfred Hitchcock was one of the studio's most famous directors, using Pinewood or Lime Grove to film at. Alas and sadly, he had no involvement in the movie at Brandon. In this case, the role of director went to Mr Herbert Mason. He had a lengthy experience in directing Vaudeville Theatre in London, but this was his first at shooting a movie. He would go on to direct 15 more movies in a career spanning the 1930s and 40s. But for now, I've given the background to the movie, so let's now look at what took place in Brandon. According to a local newspaper, it was at 3am on Friday the 25th of October that a two-seater car raced along the country lanes near Munford and Cranage, pursued at speed by police motorcycles. There was an inherent danger to this due to the frost lying on the ground, which made conditions slippery for the vehicles and uncomfortable for the car occupants, as it was an open-top convertible and they were not allowed to wear hats, scarves or goggles. This was one of the first opportunities to see the filming in action around Brandon and a number of people travelled to Munford to see behind the scenes. They were treated to retake after retake as the director Herbert Mason tried to gain a different perspective on the chase from different angles. Then, finally, he had all the scenes he needed and the film crew packed up and left. A local newspaper announced the working title of the film to be Bad Blood and filming had already been carried out in France and down the road in Mildenhall, and was due to visit Brandon proper in a couple of days' time. However, the schedule was disrupted when the town experienced heavy rain, and so it was rescheduled to take place a week later, on the evening of Friday the 1st of November. In the film, John Mills' character is driving the car during night time, and it speeds along to evade the police on the motorcycles behind him. Alongside him is his girlfriend played by Lily Palmer. A key moment in the film is when he drives down into a river under a bridge to hide and evade the pursuing police. They, after momentarily losing sight of him, continue over the bridge and he is then free. This scene was to be played out on Brandon's Bridge and in front of huge crowds who had been assembling since it began getting dark. The crowds stay until dawn when the first light then signals the end of filming and the shot calls for John Mills' car to travel at speed from the high street, veering right off the road and down the bank into the river. The stunt crew had set up a ramp at the bottom of the bank, which was to project the car upward and clear halfway over the river before it landed in the water. The element of danger in this scene means that John Mills and Lily Palmer were replaced by a stuntman. The stuntman was a Mr H.G. Foster, and he is one of a group of stuntmen known as Chrysler Stuntmen and Lily Palmer is replaced by a female dummy. Foster accelerated the car down the high street, skidded off the road, and then down the bank, and he hits the ramp. Unexpectedly, the car flies up across the river like an aircraft, and far beyond its projected river like an aircraft, and far beyond its projected arc. And for a split second, people think he may embed the vehicle into the side wall of the maltings on the opposite bank. Thankfully, it falls just short of the maltings and lands among a reed bed in the river. Foster was then directed to duck down behind the steering wheel, just as the motorcyclists are seen driving across the old bridge. With the motorcycles disappearing out of shot and most likely slowing down outside the Ram Hotel, the stuntman is given the all clear. He unfurls from his crouched position, clambers out of the seat and stands on top of the car, where he was given a huge round of applause by those who had taken up a vantage point, many of them in the upper floors of the Maltings or on the bridge just out of shot. Mr Foster is then recovered from the river and taken back to the White Hart Hotel, where he is staying overnight. No doubt the November waters of the Little Ouse were very cold at that time. John Mills and Lily Palmer would vouch for that the following evening. The movie's director, Herbert Mason, was happy that he had all the dangerous high-speed action he needed, he just needed some close-up shots of the main stars sat in the vehicle, giving the impression that they had been in the car all through the chase. So this called for yet another cold night of filming, which was done the very next evening on Saturday the 2nd of November. John Mills and Lily Palmer were filmed inside the car, but at a much slower speed, and the close-ups gave the impression that they were driving towards the bridge. They were then taken by rowboat to the vehicle left in the river overnight, which by this time was an extremely damp and cold place to be sat. After Herbert Mason had completed his filming, 
The crew and actors return back to their rooms at the White Hart Hotel, again no doubt to warm up and dry off. The following day the film crew departed, leaving Brandon behind, but one of the movie stars did remain much longer. The vehicle that had crashed down into the river, a Delage sports car, suffered a broken front axle and was retrieved by towelers who run a bus company at the time, and it was taken back to their garage just off London Road. This photo, reproduced with kind permission of Annie Abbs, shows the damage to the vehicle. Annie says that her father, Alf Cunningham, was John Mills' driver at the time. It was fair to say that there was a lot of anticipation in Brandon to see the movie when it was released. How prominent would Brandon Bridge be in the movie? Now, unlike today's movies, post-production for First Offence was a relatively speedy process. There was no CGI to implant into scenes or lengthy music scores to record, which can add up to a year to a film's release date. First Offence got its first showing at a film trade show in London's Hippodrome on Friday the 21st of February, just 16 weeks after John Mills and Lily Palmer was sat in a waterlogged car by Brandon Bridge. Its actual general release date was set for April, but it would be a much longer wait for Brandon audiences to see it. The actual first screening of the movie in Brandon itself took place at the Avenue Cinema on Thursday the 2nd of July, with the cinema proclaiming, Here at Last. Perhaps this indicates the frustration of locals that it was being shown everywhere else other than in Brandon. The cinema showed it twice a day with afternoon matinees and evening showings, until it concluded two days later on Saturday the 4th of July. The cinema did not open on Sundays and a new movie began its run the following Monday. The audiences at the Avenue Cinema cheered loudly when they recognised the Brandon Bridge scenes, along with those at Mildenhall, Munford and Cranage. Brandon's part in the movie was edited down to about five minutes, but it is still a significant part of a movie that lasts just 66 minutes. Back in the day, a movie experience involved two short movies with an interval in the middle which was an ideal time to stock up on ice cream, sweets, drinks and have a toilet break. The second movie, shown after First Offence in Brandon, was named Breach of Promise, which was an American movie released four years earlier. Again, it lasted just over an hour. Despite all the local interest, the film is largely now forgotten and did not even make the top 200 worldwide films released that year. That notwithstanding, it still holds a lot of interest in Brandon, and efforts over the years to find a copy have come to nothing. While many old black and white movies, including a large selection of John Mills' back catalogue, have been shown on TV or released in video or DVD formats, most frustratingly, First Offence has not resurfaced since the 1930s. Three years ago I contacted the British Film Institute, as I had been informed they may hold the rights to the film. Sadly, they were not able to help, and the company they put me on to were also unable to offer any assistance. However, I have recently contacted the BFI again after discovering they acquired a VHS copy of the movie in October 2000. I'm not expecting great things, but I will let you know what happens. So, if you were hoping to catch a glimpse of the movie featuring Brandon, then I am sorry to say you will be disappointed. However... The search continues, not just by me, but I know others are on the case too, and hopefully one day 